I've seen horrific things as a result of the occupation. As a result of that, I have been a very strong advocate within my party. Um, the, before the 7th of October, because I think it's worth remembering, because sometimes this is forgotten in general media discourse, the history of the region did not begin on the 7th of October. Um, Prior to the 7th of October, uh, we had resumed funding for the UN agency. Prior to the 7th of October, uh, we had returned to the language of describing the Palestinian territories as the occupied Palestinian territories. We had uh, established as Australia's position that the settlements are illegal under international law. Uh, And I respect absolutely that, uh, and I personally was responsible uh, as, as a seconder for the resolution that went through our national conference some years ago, uh, calling for the recognition of the state of Palestine. Uh, Where, so, is Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? But you are not sorry. Yeah, I just go. Sorry. So, and I respect absolutely that all of that doesn't change the ferocity of the moment we're in right now. I just think for, for context, it's worth... Call it a genocide? Call it a genocide! What I will say is this. In the first instance, um, well, I'll say this. When the United Nations voted uh, to call for a ceasefire, at the, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, the Australian government sought amendments. The amendments that we sought involved uh, references and acknowledging the horror of the 7th of October uh, and, and the killings that day. Uh, those amendments were unsuccessful when the only question in front of us was will we support a resolution calling for a ceasefire or will we not support a resolution for a ceasefire? We voted for a ceasefire. Yeah, and I know, to be fair to you, you are one of the handful of ministers who have spoken publicly, expressing deep concern about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and I know your constituents have expressed deep concern to you. Nevertheless, this, there, is a view, there is a view that um, the government could do more to, to put pressure. Do you think you've been strong enough, not you personally, but do you think you've been strong enough and fast enough in getting to the position of a ceasefire because there was an abstention at the United the Nations before you voted for it. Uh, I know that was because the original motion didn't mention Gaza. But have you been quick enough and strong enough to get to this position? And, and what can the government do moving forward to apply pressure, understanding that we're not in that part of the world? Start by calling it a fucking genocide! Call it a genocide! I'm going to get you to ask your questions at the end because we're giving you the opportunity and I'm going to get him to answer mine just at the moment and then we're going to move on to the ask. So if you've got a question that I don't ask, you are really welcome to go to the mic at the end and, and ask it and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to ask it and if you don't get your question, as I said, I'm going to sit you down like we did last year because it keeps things moving along and everybody gets to have their say but I'm going to ask my questions at the moment and get the minister to answer them. Thank you. Okay. The question <laughs> it was a while ago. Well, I, I don't think the point is being made. I acknowledge that oh, you, sorry, you have yeah. spoken out, and others, and Pusik, and others, have, and Ali, others have spoken out. But there, there is a view um, that the government has been too slow to get to the position of ceasefire and not forceful enough. What do you say to that? Yeah. Um, it's a view that is really strong in my community as well. Obviously, I'm not going to say anything other than the cabinet position. I'm a member of cabinet. So <laughs> Spineless! I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Be brave, Tony, be brave. That's called cool complicity. You're supporting genocide. You're supporting genocide. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying not to interrupt. So. <laughs>
Okay, I'm asking these questions. Remember, we have the rules and we're going to stick to them. Otherwise, I'm going to have to ask you to go and I really want you to have the opportunity because if I ask you to go, you won't get to ask your question. So, so you can ask your questions at the end. I, I'm deliberately not responding because I know the question because is going to come. Don't, don't worry, you'll get, you'll get a response. Because, because this is an arts forum and I'm giving a lot of opportunity to politics right now, but just remember why everyone else is here as well, so, okay? Just let him answer. Just let him answer. Just let him answer. Uh, so the, but the, the cynical answer is, yes, there's a huge frustration from a lot of people. A huge frustration. Um, what, what's here is, is part of that, but I, yeah, I, 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 was, I was with the Palestinian community on Christmas Day. The, the individual stories that people tell, and they're not getting it from the news, they're getting it from their families. Uh, they're getting very direct, unfiltered information of what's happening on the ground is horrific. Uh, there, you know, the the position, the things that Australia can do. Uh, there are some things that are within that are not within our control. Getting people through the Rafa crossing is not within our control. We get a lot of people asking for that, but that list is controlled by Israel and Egypt. Right. It's not controlled by Australia. Um, we're in charge of whether we give someone a visa, but the whole lot of people we've given visas to, we can't get through the rapid crossing. That issue comes to me a lot. The issue of even subsequent to voting for a ceasefire, I still get people all the time saying, why won't you just say ceasefire? Um, notwithstanding the vote, that's, I, you know, that, that is what it is. Um, I think regard, I, I think the other thing that probably hasn't had enough attention, um, which is really important, is even if a ceasefire were to happen tomorrow, the debilitating nature of the occupation um, can't be seen through any lens that somehow at the moment of ceasefire uh, we have a solution. Um, until we have uh, a, a place that is as safe and independent to live as Pal uh, called Palestine as Israel is, um, then then I don't I don't see a point short of that where we can in any way say the job's done, and that's before you even get to the concept of re the rebuilding that's going to have to happen. So I have two more questions on this subject. So bear with me. I have two more questions on this subject. Um, what is the government doing to ensure that Australia does not issue weapons export permits to um, oh, countries that can use those weapons? The only information I have on that is with respect to, and, and this is slightly different to what you said, so I'm acknowledging that, but I'll just give you the information that I have, is in terms of claims that have been on the internet that the Australian government is sending military resources to the conflict, the, that, that is... I've been assured is completely wrong. About the completely licenses. wrong. No, I just explained. I, I, I just explained that I, I'm only giving you the information that I have. Well, the point is, the what point about is being made. Okay? Providing intelligence. He's, he's, to be fair, he's not the relevant minister, but I asked him a question. Oh, 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 so <laughs> he's the minister here answering our questions, which we appreciate. Sorry, and yeah. Mark, are you finished? And, and my, my final question is there is concern that this conflict has gone beyond seeking to root out Hamas and that it has become something bigger and the word has been gen genocide has been used here. What is your response to those concerns? Do you share those concerns? Um, okay, so I'll, first of all, there is a way that people are asked to interview where there is always a test of words. Will you use the word genocide? Will you use the word apartheid? On the Israeli side, it's how many times in the interview will you issue a condemnation of Hamas? And it's as though, it's as though there's, there's all these tests and anything short of that particular test that has been set for you is a complete fail. And what then, and what, and what then happens what then happens is we end up with a debate about the word and not a debate about what is happening on the ground. So let me... The word is what's happening. So let me put it in these terms, because I think they matter. 
The Israeli Defence Minister said there will be no food, no water, no fuel. This is a complete siege and then described the community in Gaza as human animals. Similarly, you had different claims being made about bombing, about who was in fact being targeted. It is very difficult to question who is being targeted when it is the actions of a sniper. The reports we've seen of snipers have been shooting one unarmed woman and then an older woman who went to help the, the unarmed woman who'd been shot. Similarly, similarly, the destruction of civilian infrastructure has been extraordinary. The only time that I have seen an acknowledgement of a mistake was when a sniper shot someone holding a white flag, something which is meant to be protected under the rules of war. Now, in providing all of those examples, there will be words that are occurring to people in their minds, and I would rather keep the debate to what is in fact happening on the on the ground. Because, because very simply, if I had used the word that's being asked of me, people would have gone away thinking and comparing, well, is it identical to the Holocaust? That's what would have happened. The discussion that I believe, that I believe makes a difference is in people hearing the facts of what ha is happening on the ground and they will very quickly choose words to describe it. Thank you. Okay, so here's what's going to happen now. I, I have finished my questions about that subject and I'm going to ask you to respectfully listen to the rest or, or move on, whatever you prefer to do. I'm talking to the people at the front. You're welcome to stay, but I'm going to ask you to do it quietly because I have arts questions to ask. You just said this is democracy. It is. None of us have to ask questions. Yes, you have a chance to ask questions at the end. I've, I've explained that a number of times. There's a mic right there. You, if you have more questions, there are many questions. If you have more questions, you can line up and ask them. And I've explained the rules. I've done it twice. I'm not going to do it a third time. I think you understand. Is everyone happy with that approach? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I... Thank you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask people to, to, to just let us go, go on now, because we've had a good, good go on that subject. It's a very important yeah, subject, and people feel very strongly about it. So I understand and appreciate that, and I'm sure the Minister does too. So... I, okay, I've asked you... I'm going to ask the security to move you on if you can't be quiet. Please. That's the, that's the choice, okay? Because people are allowed to hear the rest of the talk, so what's, what's your answer? Are you, going, are you going to let me finish? I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, thanks. So, Minister, we, we've talked about the arts and politics and we've talked about the relationship between the two, but I want to, you know, change the tone a little bit and ask you about the role of the arts in politics and political decision-making. Because, and we'll come to the issue of funding and choices that governments have to make, but... You mentioned the arts being seen as being elitist. You know, what, what role do, do, does arts and creative practice play in decision making in, in government? I remember a story you told last year when you spoke about Paul Keating, when the minister, playing um, Mahler, classical music, for some of his cabinet ministers, and leaving them a bit puzzled. I mean, does our voice speak tunes? What do you, what do you, what do you, what role does it play in your uh, political practice? Yep, we've talked about that. And I've asked you, so now I'm going to ask them to move you on. Okay? If you can't be quiet. Okay? Thank you. I've asked twice. More than twice. Okay? So I'm now, I've told you I'm changing the subject. We're moving on to the subject that was advertised. Thanks, Minister. What role do the, art, do the politics, do the arts and creative practice play in political decision making? Do they play a direct role or are they seen as something separate? Yeah, the, I think the answer...